Okay. Let's make a start. Thank you so much for coming, everyone, to this special discussion of empire history and memory in the UK. This is um, the IHR's annual Eisenberg family uh, lecture in public history, um, which was established at the Institute of Historical Research in 2019 by friends and family of the late David Eisenberg. David passed away in 2017, at the age of six. Um, at the time of his death, uh, he was living in London. He recently retired as a partner uh, at the law firm uh, White and Case. Although that was David's profession, he had a lifelong love for and passion for, for history. Um, and friends and colleagues remember the, the breadth and depth of his knowledge of different historical periods and subjects. He was an active trustee of the IHR, and in 2013, he established a lectureship series at the Institute in honor of his parents, Jack and Diana Eisenberg, which brought leading historical scholars to the Institute to deliver lectures in a variety of fields. So following David's passing, friends and family thought it was appropriate to honor his memory uh, by donating funds to continue uh, a public lecture series uh, in public history. Um, and I think this discussion today fits the, the brief of the Eisenberg lecture perfectly. We have three outstanding public historians. Um, and we're going to discuss how history the history of empire is remembered in the UK in a variety of different ways, in terms of academic history, but also popular history, if we can call it that, and popular culture. Why has it become such a, a major issue in the sort of contemporary culture wars? And how should historians position themselves in this divided and partisan environment? Uh, we're delighted to have three distinguished speakers with us today. Um, Seth Antangera is an award-winning writer and presenter. You all know his 2021 monograph, Empire Land, How Imperialism Has Shaped Modern Britain. Uh, he won numerous awards. It was named as Book of the Year at the National Book Awards in 2022 and formed the basis for a Channel 4 series. His latest book, Stolen History, The Truth About the British Empire and How It Shaped Us, was published this year by Penguin, and is an imperial history for children, which is an interesting form in it itself. Next to Sathnan is Charlotte Vidya Riley, who is Associate Professor of History at the University of Southampton, and a specialist on the Labour Party and post-war imperial history. Um, again, uh, linked to the theme of today's discussion, in 2021, uh, Charlotte edited a collection called Free Speech Wars, How Did We Get Here and Why Does It Matter, published by Manchester University Press. Her latest excellent book uh, is called Imperial Island, A History of Empire in Modern Britain, published earlier this year by Penguin. I'm sure you've seen reviews of it in some of the, the major newspapers. It's been very widely reviewed. And finally, we have Anne Lester, who's Professor of Historical Geography at the University of Sussex, very closely associated with the growth of what we call the new imperial history. He co-edits the MUP Studies in Imperialism series, and his most recent book, uh, Deny and Disavow, Distancing the Imperial Past in the Culture Wars was published last year. And it employs a variety of forms, including memoir, travelogue, um, to discuss empire and what it means today. And I, I would also mention that earlier in the year, the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History, which I then uh, edited, co-edited, uh, published a piece by Allen reviewing uh, 
Nigel Bigger's colonialism uh, history and a response by Nigel Bigger, which was in the best, the best tradition of a great academic puncher. Um, and it's, uh, I think they're, 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 they're open access, if you want to, to have a look. Um, uh, great, great fighting pieces. Uh, my name's Philip Murphy. I'm director of uh, history and policy at the Institute of Historical Research. I was, uh, for a period, uh, director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and I've also laboured in the vineyard of imperial history uh, myself over the, over the years. So what we're going to have today is really a, a, what I hope will be a fairly free-flowing discussion uh, with the panellists, between the panellists, for you know, maybe 40, 45 minutes, see how it, see how it goes, and then we'll open it up uh, to the floor. Uh, so please, as, as the speakers are discussing various issues, think of a question or two, uh, so I can, we can hit the ground running when, when uh, the, floor is, the floor is open. Um, so I'm going to ask each of the, each of the panelists really the same question, starting with Satna. Why did you write? Okay, Satan gets two bites of the cherry, which is maybe unfair, but I'm going to allow him. First, Empire Land, and then Stolen History. What was the, what was the story behind the writing of those books? And why did you choose the forms that you chose for those books? Uh, thank you for the introduction. Also, it's the first time my book's ever been called a monograph. So I feel really intellectual. Surely, surely not. No, outside universities, no one says the word monograph. <laughs> monograph. Let me tell my mum later. Yeah, that is shocking. <laughs> <laughs> monograph. Um, also, it's an honour to be here generally because I've written a sequel to Empire Land, Empire World, out next year. And each one of you is in it. Your amazing books. And also, you haven't mentioned your own book because you're too modest. But Philip has written a really amazing book about the Commonwealth. Pretty much the only thing you, you need to read about that bizarre organization. <laughs> um, I ended up writing Empire Land. I'm not really a historian. I still slightly feel weird when I'm described as a historian. I am technically a historian. You know, I'm a member of the RHS, a fellow. Although I get confused, with, you get confused between the RHS and the, the Royal Historical Society, the Royal Horticultural Society. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm surprised it was different. Like <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fellow of the RHS and I bought a rose bush. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say I'm a journalist who's trying to learn about history. I started writing Empire Land as an accident. I was researching a novel about one particular guy, a guy called Dean Mohammed, one of the first ever Indians to come to Britain. And he came over from India with the East India Company guy, went to Ireland. And I thought, oh, I better research the historical context of his life. And that's when I realized I knew nothing about the East India Company. And actually the research became more interesting than the novel. And also realized that lots of people around me in my life also knew nothing about the British Empire, even though it explains so much about our lives, explains multicultural Britain, I argue it explains a lot of the racism that people of color faced in, in the 20th century and 21st century, explains our education system, explains being a Sikh, the Sikh identity is so tied up in the British Empire. We see ourselves as a community almost entirely through the prison of the martial race theory, which is created by the British. And yet, I didn't know about it, so I, I wrote a book kind of for idiots, written by an idiot, um, about the empire, kind of easy access guide to this really difficult subject. And uh, I think a lot of people felt the same way. And, and it was amazing to get letters from people who studied history at Oxford and said they knew nothing about the British Empire. So I think there's quite a, a big market in that. And I endlessly had people say, I wish I'd learned this at school, can you write something for kids? And I didn't want to because I didn't want to water down the violence, which I think is an intrinsic part of the enterprise. I didn't want to water down the violence of slavery. But eventually a publisher allowed me to talk about those things. And uh, I wrote a kid's version, which seems to have gone okay. Many more people shout at me at events like this for adults than at kiddie events. <laughs> <laughs> So, Charlotte, same, same question, and, and I mean, in a way, your book is the, the most, I uh, mean this entirely positive way, conventional of, of the various books, although you do sort of position 
yourself in New Newham at the beginning. Newham des described in the LRB as a, what is it, I can't read my, uh, uh, macabre laboratory of white nationalism. Um, yeah, macabre laboratory of all the worst things that the white race has done. Right. Um, yeah, the book is, um, I think when I was writing it, because I basically, I, 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 I pitched this book and I was working on the proposal for this book in 2018, 2019, and I met with publishers on the day of the election, actually, in 2019. Um, and then I, I kind of signed the contract, and I signed the contract in March 2020, um, the beginning of March 2020, and then um, the pandemic happened and all the libraries closed. So it wasn't the best timing for trying to write a, a book. And, and so I think the re one of the reasons why it's book ended by Newham is because I was forced to write a lot more of this book. <laughs> from Newham, <laughs> from my house than I had otherwise envisaged. And, and Newham um, is one of the most diverse boroughs in, in London, in the country. It's one of the youngest boroughs, it's one of the poorest boroughs in the country. So as a sort of prism of looking at empire, it's a really good space, actually. And there are some particular moments throughout the book. And I start the book with the life of Kamal Junji, um, and it's kind of reflected at the end, because the, the street that the mayor's office is on in um, basically uh, uh, London Docklands has moved quite recently and that street used to be called something like Siemens Street I think because it was a business area and it's been rena renamed Kamal Shinshi Way so it's a nice kind of end. Um, I, I, when I was thinking about writing this book and when I was kind of writing the proposal for this book um, part of the premise of it was that there's been an enormous amount of work on kind of new imperial history uh, on both the 19th and 20th century, quite a lot of work um, on um, empire and how it's impacted Britain in the 19th century, quite a lot on the 20th century, increasingly work on how decolonization has impacted Britain in the 20th century, though that's not been as, as done as much as the, the earlier period. But a lot of this work hasn't really been written for a, for a popular audience, a lot of it hasn't made it into trade books. And I think as a historian, there's this weird dissonance where you're like, oh, you know, but everyone has, we've done this, right? We all know about this. We all know that the empire has impacted the metropole. We all know that decolonization has an ongoing effect on British people's lives. You know, why would we tell this story again? And then you look at the books that you can buy in paperback and water since, and you go, okay, well, it's now Ferguson, and now it's Saturn. But it's, you know, it was in, it, for a, quite a long time, certainly when I was selling this book, which was not out yet, mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, it, they're just, the conversation that we all think we've had a lot of times hasn't really been had for a wider audience. Um, and the other theoretical <laughs> sort of my, I think one of the things that Penguin and Bodley Head were interested in when I was pitching the book, uh, particularly I think one of the reasons that we kind of went with Bodley Head was that it, the idea is that it's a history book for people who wouldn't necessarily gravitate towards history books um, in and who might be interested in books on kind of contemporary politics and culture, and who might want to get some context for the things they think about that. Um, so there's lot, there was lots of talk in like all the marketing meetings about like, oh, but it's a history book for Gen Z, and I was like, my students are Gen Z, they're not. <laughs> but that idea of like trying to talk to people who wouldn't necessarily engage with this as a first instinct, I think, is, is something that's worthwhile. Good. Thank you very much. And uh, Alan, um, over to you again. Why the form that this book took? Because it's very, it, it chops and changes between different different forms, really, doesn't it? There's, there's a part, very engaging part, where you almost do this sort of Mrs. Dalloway walk along Whitehall talking about some statues. So why did you choose to write it? Yeah, I think a couple of reasons. One, picking up the from where Charlotte just left off this disjuncture between academic and popular history and you know I disavow was a kind of experimental book for me and I, I very much really think I'm a, a, a novice trying to find my way as a public historian <laughs> with, with that, uh, that book uh, and partly it was because I had been you know, in the ivory tower for about 30 years working on different aspects of empire uh, being aware of shifts in the historiography hopefully contributing to them as well one of which was attending more to the voices of colonized peoples so subaltern groups trying to appreciate understandings of empire that were not from the 
perspective of white imperial officials, although a lot of my books actually are about white imperial officials, but the consequences of their decisions for colonised people. So having become aware of these sort of shifts in the understanding of empire, <coughs> one of the factors that, that convinced me to try and escape the ivory tower a little bit, this first sort of foray outside to see how it went, was the reaction, uh, the backlash against Black Lives Matter uh, and against the topping of the Costa statue in June 2020, which I took as an activist invitation to the British public mm -hmm. to educate themselves and become more aware of uh, the way in which our history is embedded, not just in our urban fabric, but in everything that someone writes about in, in Empire Land, our like society, our culture, our values, our morals, and so on. And I was uh, appalled at the government uh, reaction against uh, that invitation to reconsider our history uh, and our elements of the right wing press and some elements of an academia who seemed to want me to reverse all of these historiographical shifts that have been taking place in academic history and to reinscribe notions of empire <coughs> that came directly from those imperial officials at the time with a few tweaks through time to justify acts of colonialism and acts of imperialism. So that was one motivation. But I think the other thing was just that for a, a period, I was obliged to sort of leave the outline of tower anyway, because I was quite ill and in hospice for a lot of the time and this was going on. So I had a moment upon which to reflect, in which I couldn't do any archival research myself, I wasn't teaching. So I might as well use this sort of 30 years of experience in the field to try and reach out and try and counter some of the distortions of the colonial past that this right-wing backlash uh, was generating public discourse. So the, the book is kind of experimental, and as you say, it does adopt various forms. Uh, you know, as I try to find ways of being more engaging than I have been in the last 30 years of my career. <laughs> One day I might get there. <laughs> uh, I mean, how did you how did you find the the experience of writing a different sort of book? Because I found doing doing Empire's new clothes quite quite liberating. Yeah, um, and I think I think all three uh, of, of the, the authors here just wonderful stylists. And do you feel it gave you a greater sort of license really for doing certain sort of stuff? Yeah, but very much so. And I certainly wouldn't describe myself as a stylist in the plane of these two. But, uh, it, it, I did feel liberated. Uh, I felt liberated not not so much from the you know, the density of footnotes and all the things that you might expect as a difference between academic writing and popular writing. But liberated more from the anxiety about making conceptual advances. <laughs> and I think particularly because I come from a historical geography background as, as well as history, that there's a, a very strong emphasis when you're responding to the academic pressures of the ref um, to, to make sure that there's a conceptual twist, a nuance, um, you know, a shift in the way of understanding something and everything you write. And just to be liberated from that and just be able to explain what I knew. Just, just the knowledge that I've accumulated through, through time. That was very liberating. And liberating too to try to experiment with, with different ways of, of conveying that. So hence the sort of walking to the statues in Westminster, which I replicated on the summer school. And it's lovely to see some of the participants here today, uh, a month or so ago, um, looking at some of these statues and taking my cue from the Black Lives Matter protesters in Colston and using these statues to narrate various parts of empire. It's amazing how much you if you cover the lives of people like General Wolsey or Henry Bartle Frere, because they were everywhere, uh, involved in all sorts of human conflicts uh, and, and political of planning and engagement. So just experimenting with that, I found liberating. I'm not sure how successful it was, but I enjoyed doing it. So, I mean, for, the, for those of us who sort of put a, a towel in the water from our ivory towers, and, I mean, Sathnan is, is, is in a completely different league, really, aren't you? I mean, the, the amount of coverage that Empire Land got uh, in the press uh, and, and the media. Could you tell us something about the reaction to that? How much of it did you expect? How much of it surprised you? What, what lessons did you take away from, from the reaction to Empire Land? Uh, yeah, I don't think your book, by the way, means like, I didn't realize you were an intense academic. <laughs> I mean, I think all your books are incredibly readable. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't expect the reaction I got. I remember when you signed your contract, actually, because 
it was around the same time I was writing my book. And I remember being a reading when I was halfway through it at a friend's literary event, and it was greeted with silence. <laughs> and uh, they didn't understand whether it was a memoir, journalism, history. Black Lives Matter hadn't happened yet. And then suddenly it happened, and it created this global interest in the way colonialism shaped the modern world. I remember I'd just finished it, and there was a Clyde Murray item on BBC News. And it was about how the racism of the British Empire had influenced the racism <coughs> in America. And it was like someone had read my mind and my manuscript. And when suddenly it was a lead item on the BBC News. It was wild. It just, I, I couldn't really, I've never had an experience like that. And then there was massive interest, although it was the pandemic. So I did something like 57 events all from my living room table. But like there was so much interest and demand, not just from the few <coughs> festivals, but from you know the foreign office diplomats who wanted to talk about empire and how it shapes foreign policy. Um, there was kids who suddenly wanted to read history. And also I was amazed at the response from historians. I was worried that the historians would think I'd nick their stuff or that I was an idiot, I'd done things wrong but it's been almost entirely positive from Australians. Hopefully because I quote them <laughs> by name whenever I can. Very important. Yeah, at length. And um, it's been an incredible experience. And, you know, kids, I met a kid the other day who turned up a festival who's studying history at college now. You know, it was given away to, 15,000 copies were given away to schools. I don't think any, most writers get that experience of writing a book and immediately affecting people in that educational way. Also, there was a backlash. And I know that well, just before we get to the backlash, I mean, the, the, I remember one of the foreign office historians saying that they, they had you speak and how great it was, and how, how was sort of engaging with policy makers, engaging with government, how, how was that? That's wild, yeah. Politicians started ringing me, like Malcolm Turnbull, the former Prime Minister of Australia. Just rang, I don't know how he got my number. <laughs> he just talked to me for an hour. Um, yeah, it's crazy. And sorry, what's the question again? Just engaging with, with policy makers, so the foreign yeah. office, for example, how they think about imperial legacies as an issue in the daily job. And companies as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really sincere, and I think it mainly came from Black Lives Matter. And um, there was some, a bit of, uh, you know, lack of warmth from the museum sector, perhaps. Did have a bit of an argument with George Osborne. Because I said that only 1% of the British Museum was collection was on display, and he said, that's not really fair, because some of the items are really small. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a bit of an argument with him, but he was friendly, vaguely. But yeah, I mean, there was a backlash, and in the form mainly, initially, of kind of comments, because I do work for the Times, on the Times website, which got more and more racist, and then handwritten letters, and then kind of death threats. And I think people of color writing about this, David Olusoga, me, get a lot of crap. The women of color writing about this get the worst. Um, but David Olusoga has a bodyguard, you know? And I think it's because he's on TV a lot. And I think it's because when you're talking about rich empire, you're talking about race. And when a brown person or black person appears on screen and offers an alternative, an alternative narrative about the British Empire, which for a lot of people shapes their sense of themselves, their family, it triggers them. And they see someone saying, my family, are you saying my family were evil because they were involved in the empire? We're not saying that, but that's the way it's, it is sometimes received. And yeah, it can get toxic, and I haven't really done events like this for a year now. Um, but I'm going to get back into it um, because you can't live your life like that, right? And what about what about children? What 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 about reaction from children to the Stalin history book? Ninety nine point nine percent positive, <laughs> mainly because they they don't come with that baggage. Yeah. The baggage can be family stories. It can be people who went through the education system at a certain time, certain school they went to. It can sometimes be that they went to a very old-fashioned English school abroad. I think Kemi Badenoch went to one of those schools in Nigeria. I went to visit one in Nigeria. And they are teaching the kind of stuff 
that was being taught in boarding schools in the 1950s. They're still teaching it. And yeah, and that creates these narratives. And obviously, we have politicians in charge of our education system, Michael Gove and so on, who are imperially nostalgic. And you Rishi Sunak saying we should not unpick history. So this has become a national culture war, and Boris Johnson really went for it. We'll come, we'll come on to that. Just, um, Charlotte, in Imperial Island, the, it's been very widely reviewed. What, what was your kind of takeaway from the reviews? Were there, again, were there things that surprised you, or did, did it kind of, did the sort of predictable comments come from the predictable places? To an extent, I think, I mean, it's very fair to say it's been widely reviewed because why it doesn't give an indication of what? <laughs> <laughs> just a number of reviews. Um, I think just picking up actually on something that Saffron was saying about um, the way that the identity of the writer really shapes the response that you get. When I was writing the book and I was doing, you know, bits of media and publicity, because obviously I, I, well, obviously, but I do quite a lot of writing outside academic history, but not always on history, or a lot of stuff to do with contemporary yeah. events, to do with empire, or to do with the <coughs> Labour Party or feminism, and and the stuff that I've got the absolutely worst kind of backlash, the worst kind of um, you know the worst kind of hate mail, the worst kind of death threats was talking about um, Karens, the concept of Karens, because it's talking about white womanhood, and then and then if you're a white woman suddenly that's the frame in which. So I do think there's a way in which particular you know your identity really shapes the response to particular things. Yeah. And again, like when I was talking about that, I was doing it as an imperial historian talking about the history of white womanhood in empire, but it got taken very much as a critique of white womanhood today and, and you know, being called a kind of traitor. I got a lot of, a lot of hate mail that was kind of called me a traitor. Um, which you are. Which I obviously <laughs> don't. <laughs> yeah. um, the, feed, the feedback on this book, the reviews on this book, I think, um, have been to some extent very predictable. So we got a very nice review in the New States and they got a not so nice review in the Daily Telegraph. Um, the person who reviewed it in the Daily Telegraph then commissioned a second review yeah. of it. Got three stars though in the Telegraph. It got three stars, it got yeah. 60%, yeah, which that's... is a two one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and you know, enough yeah. things that you can yeah. pull out some good things, but you know, that I think. The, so, it's like when Peter Bradshaw and the Guardian. Reviews an action movie and gives it three stars. I think that's a exactly. kind of a, an accolade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the one that surprised me, the one that really surprised me, was the Sunday Times review. Um, oh yeah. Not not because of the not because of the kind of overall judgment. It was reviewed by Dominic Sandro for the Sunday Times. Yeah. Um, I think it was quite sort of when I saw it, it was Dominic Sandro. I knew he would yeah. like the book. I did check how many. I I don't even refer to him by name once in the book. I wasn't particularly critical, but I thought he. He's not going to love it. But the thing that surprised me about the Dominic Sandbrook review was that the last two paragraphs of the review were telling, were objecting to the fact that I was telling off the reader about things. And he said I was scolding the reader and telling them off and ticking them off. I was disappointed in the reader. I was um, because of the, I think what he thought of as lack of understanding of my perspective in imperial history. But a lot of this was projection from him. He, I didn't use any of those words. Um, yeah. He felt told off. Uh, and actually, I don't, Charlotte, you've not yeah. mentioned the one of you. Uh, I've read several of those reviews, but there was one review that dragged me into it. This is the one that um, the Telegraph um, editor commissioned. It was, oh, so it was on, was on a, it's a weird website that yeah. published it, right? Yeah. And uh, not, it went viral on the right. Some people like Mara Ferguson were retreat, yeah. retreating it, saying, finally, they've been armed. And I don't really see any particular problem with what the guy said, except he'd taken the most cynical possible interpretation of all the books. Also, the website on which it appeared was a shadow, shadowly funded right-wing website, which a lot of the groups behind this culture were, I would say. Yeah, it was, and, and that was, um, yeah, now I've worked on the example of that yeah. review, and, and it, it described this genre, I would say, and also kind of Peter Mitchell's book about imperial nostalgia as, um, it said that there was a genre hardening of that kind of imperial apologia, um, he was very critical of my accusation that the Queen was a colonialist, which he thought was beyond the pale, um, <laughs> as a critique. But it was a, it sort of, I think, I'm really interested in the way that some reviewers, you know, it got, it got a nice review in the 
financial times, it got nice review in the Deputy Foods mm. Industry magazine, it mm. wasn't quite packed. But I'm really interested in the way, and I'm writing a piece at the moment about the way that some reviewers seem to think that what historians who take our kind of perspective are, that we're calling for people to feel like shame or guilt mm. about this history, which I don't think we are. I don't think any of us want people to read it and kind of but personally feel guilty and shamed about this history. But um, it seems yeah. to be a real perception that we do, and I'm really interested in that. I'm really interested in why people think that they, they're being told that they should feel guilty about it. And that. Alan, you've got, you've got a conclusion where you basically have a paragraph saying, I'm not telling people to be guilty. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to do uh, in Denying this Girl was you know, not only set out a, a sort of set of current understandings about the empire, what it was, how colonialism operated and so on, but also include a much more recent history of the culture wars. Mm -hmm. Why is this stuff being denied now? Uh, you know, what, what's happened in our politics over the last three, four, five years um, to generate such hostility to empirically based historical work on empire, a work that to violence and racism, essentially, why is it now dismissed as woke in the white right the press? Mm -hmm. So, um, that's partly why the, the uh, structure is un unusual. I sort of go back and forth between telling the imperial history and writing about the culture war and, and, and how it figures today. Uh, so, yeah, I thought that probably the best way to, to end the book, the, the kind of readers I was hoping to access, was to summarize, I think it's seven um, arguments that you will see repeated again and again in the right wing press and social media from people who are denying and disavowing the past, um, aspects of the past of it, and in the, the, as far as we are able to, to determine as historians, as specialists, as experts. And, you know, why is, why is it that expertise in this field is being dismissed just as it is in terms of climate change as well? It's all part of that shadowy right wing nexus that some have alluded to in some of these think tanks, these lobbying groups around Tupton Street are behind climate change denial, as they are behind restored trust, the group that's trying to gag national trust. So there's sort of multiple fronts in this, this culture war, um, and their targets range from historians of empire through to transgender people, through to environmental activists and so on. So much of denying this is, is about that, where that has come from, uh, and the arguments that you will hear, specifically in relation to empire, uh, and ways in which we can address those arguments with the empirical understanding of historians and development. But I mean, there's, I suppose there's an argument with something like Nigel Degas' colonialism, that if you, kind of if you ignore it, it'll go away. I mean, it, 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 he's not a historian, he's a theologian. He's writing from a particular standpoint. Um, uh, I, is it necessary to engage with it? I get the feeling you kind of rather relish the, the debate. I've had this moral dilemma for a long time, I've discussed it with a number of historians, whether one should engage or not. Um, what's convinced me that it's worth engaging is a, a couple of things. One is that he has that platform, he has that voice, whether or not we challenge him. All that happens if we don't challenge him is that he goes unchallenged. Uh, you know, to give an example, I had a first face-to-face -face encounter with him this week about yeah. a debate at a, a school. Um, of which I found out that he has been giving talks on his book, lectures on his book, with no opposing voices, no historian in the room, no specialist to challenge him, um, for places like Eton, for example. Uh, so the option is that either he speaks uncontested, or we have another voice in, in the room, and I think that's, that's preferable. But the other thing that's swayed me quite a bit on this is reading more about the David Irving trial and Holocaust denial. Um, and Deborah Lipstadt's initial response was not to engage and for a perfectly understandable reason that by engaging you are giving legitimacy, you are authorising them as equal participants in the scholarly exchange if you, you engage on seemingly equal terms and they, they thrive on that credibility you know, they're a serious historian discussing with a serious historian so she tried to deny them that and obviously things changed for her when Irving took her to court um, and her choice was either to settle out of court and give in, or to, to fight in court, and she decided to fight in court. And it was through that trial, through the David Irving trial, that Irving was exposed as a charlatan, as not a proper historian. And the, the verdict in Lipstadt's favour explicitly said Holocaust denial is not history, it is anti-Semitic politics in the guise of history. And I think if it, now most historians of the Holocaust or 
not just 20th century or Muslims in general, I think, thank God she did and in the call. Uh, so I think that confrontation, where you can do it, is always preferable to letting these ideas go uncontested. I mean, I mean you didn't have yeah. a battle. Like yeah. yeah. I mean, there's there's a there's an opposite way of looking at this, which is what I think people like Nigel Bigger would, would say, is that their point of view is actually marginalised, particularly within mainstream academic discourse. And it, it is the case that uh, biggest initial publishers withdrew. Um, and you have the you have the saga of Bruce Bruce Gillies defense of colonialism in third world quarterly. If you look that up now online you'll see this kind of page not found. Which is a bit is a little bit sinister, isn't it? I mean so what 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 do you make of that that argument that that there is a point of view that deserves to be articulated. Yeah, there's a point of view that can be articulated. Whether it's taken seriously as a scholarship um, is another matter. And one of well, let's take those two cases. My understanding is that the Gilly article, I may be wrong here, but my understanding was that it was um, rejected by the academic peer reviewers when it was published nonetheless. So the initial instance was that this scholarship was not up to the standards expected. Biggers, the withdrawal of the Biggers book, I don't know who can put that ground up no. to that. There could be all sorts of reasons that he hasn't articulated why uh, he was put But as a, as a general point. But yeah. as a general point, um, one of the things that we are arguing that we need to do uh, is to maintain our scholarly ethics. What distinguishes us as scholars um, is a set of ethical codes about how you do research. It seems like you don't cherry pick sources to distort their meaning. Um, you don't um, <coughs> ignore sources which contradict your argument. You either um, try to articulate why they contradict your argument and deal with them, or you adapt your argument accordingly. And in all sorts of ways, although we're all politically driven, we're all situated, part of the code of conduct of an academic scholar is that you don't egregiously distort narratives to fit your politics. And I think it's that which renders this scholarship uh, unscholarly. Yeah, and just um, to kind of build on that, I think as well, in the tech eye sometimes, I think we've done a lot of work as historians, right, to encourage the idea, which I think which I completely agree with, and, and which I think most, most historians just accept now as a, as a kind of tenet of history, that history is subjective um, to the extent that like, we're all shaped by our positionality and the work that we do is interpretive and what different historians bring to you know, you can get five historians all writing a history of the British Empire, and they'll all come at different different perspectives, but we all choose to go to different archives and write different stories and do different things. But I think sometimes what has filtered through into the broader public understanding is, well, history is just interpretation. And I think this has happened with history more than other academic subjects. And I think there's sometimes a kind of feeling in the wider world that, well, history is just interpretation, and so who are you, you know, you're really politically motivated on the left and bigger's on the right, and so, you know, you're both equal. But that kind of doesn't accept that at the core of historical work has to be legitimate historical research and archival research. And of course, on top of that, we all come to it from different perspectives. And I, I'm a feminist historian. I believe very fundamentally in positionality and the fact that we all write different histories. But at the same time, that, that doesn't mean anyone can write anything. And you know, the Bruce Gilly article was, was bad. It, was, it wasn't just wrong. It wasn't just you know, ethically wrong or morally wrong from my perspective. It was bad writing bad history, you know, that there's, there has to be, there has to be a line of what is acceptable scholarship and what isn't. I think, um, I, I very much agree, and I think part of the uh, argument that's used by people like Peter, when, as you say, for him it's kind of free for what you either have a left-wing narrative or you have a mm -hmm. right-wing narrative. Part of that is a, a kind of scepticism about and a complete misunderstanding of the influence of post-structuralism within the mm -hmm. academy. Some of this comes from your right, people like Jordan Peterson, who have written a lot about post structuralism and seem to think and argue that it's an abandonment of the search for truth. They argue that post structuralism means there is no reality, there's no point in searching for an objective view of reality, so all you have is interpretations. And people like Bigger and part of this right wing backlash accuse the academy of being infected by post structuralism, and all of these training interpretations, as Charlotte says. And what that misses is the academic practice that we try to conduct ourselves and that we teach our students to do, 
And this is really fundamental. <coughs> what we do ourselves is what we teach our students to do. You know, we mark their essays, their work, and their research dissertations, their theses, according to whether they have put into practice the research ethics that we teach them, which is about not deliberately and egregiously distorting sources to construct a predetermined argument or a narrative. And what we preach, so we try to practice that. So we haven't given up the social truth. We just recognise that we are all situated and we try to get as close to it as we can using these professional standards. Can I, can I put a question to all three of you, which is a sort of a, a criticism that could be applied to, to each of you? That, that they're all premised on the idea that empire had a very deep shaping impact on, on British society in, in the 20th, 20th century. And uh, just a kind of anecdote, I mean, when I was writing the, what, this biography of Alan Lennox Boyd, the colonial secretary in the 1950s, so 100 years ago, um, I interviewed Brian McGee, the philosopher, who stood against Lennox Boyd in mid-Bedfordshire, the uh, well-known constituency now, um, in 1959 for Labour. And it, it was at the height of the, the Holocamp scandal, or in the wake of the Holocamp scandal and the Devlin report, and McGee was rubbing his hands and thinking this is really going to play, and of course he got, I don't think he quite lost his deposit, but he didn't make any kind of, uh, and, and the Tories romped home with a 100 seat majority in 1959. <coughs> so there's an argument about Britain, which I think is valid, and, and Bernard Porter, of course, has written absent-minded papers about it more in the 19th and 20th century. That actually what's, what's remarkable about Britain is how little domestic impact um, empire had, certainly until maybe the 1950s. What, what would you say about that? So maybe starting with Sam. Uh, well, that's plainly absurd. I mean, you've got to look at things like sugar, commodities, tea cotton, percentage of people employed in those industries. In Britain, you know, Liverpool as a city taking the side of the Confederate side of the US Civil War, just because of where the commodities were coming from. Um, it depends on how you look at it, obviously. You can do, a lot of historians decide to discount a whole bunch of things. A lot of historians just used to, back in the day, say that, you know, used to think that slavery was disconnected from empire. And that's not, I don't understand that because it obviously is a definite part of it. But you know, it's the, going back a bit to the question that came before, history is argument, but there is such things as facts, and I think that's a line we've crossed now. In that, you know, the author we are mentioning, I don't want to mention my name. <laughs> um, if you look at Niall Ferguson, right, the popular man I quote most in my books about empire, I quote him because actually historically he's pretty so he's solid. You know, factually, there's nothing factually incorrect in his book on empire. It's just his argument at the end is wild, <laughs> and I would say crazy. But factually, he's there. And I would say we're now in a in a world where we, we where the right wing have gone much further than that. I mean, facts don't matter anymore. Where and it's part of a general movement in society where the experts don't matter. It's like, oh, we don't need to listen to the scientists on COVID, or we don't need to listen to the experts on trade when it comes to Brexit, we will just decide what we think. And the same thing has happened in history. People are just saying, this is what I think, and I want to find facts to fit it. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree that firstly, a lot of the time when people make that argument, they're not thinking about things like the economics of it. If you, if you, you, know, if you believe the fundamental thesis of the very good recent book about slavery and the, and the imperial revolution, uh, sorry, the industrial revolution, that's a but if you, you know, if you can't unpick the industrial revolution from slavery, then you can't unpick the modern British economy from empire, right? So, but I also think, so in my book, for example, there's a moment at the end of the Second World War in 1948, a mass observation, the social research organisation does a survey of um, their, their sort of group of what they call, you know, ordinary British people, and it asks them about their knowledge about colonialism, yeah. and it asks them to name a colony. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and people love this survey because um, people can't name it. So, so, so they, people say a load of things when they're asked to name a colony, and uh, so one of the things they say is Lincolnshire, one of the suggestions is <laughs> Lincolnshire, which made me laugh because that's where I am from. <laughs> um, there, it's 1% of people polled thought the United States of America was still a colony in Britain. Um, but actually, um, I'm going to say two things about this. So firstly, I think it's um, actually when you dig down into the survey, you know, this is reported in like newspapers at the time, so the Daily Mail's headline is like, you know, um, percentage of British people believe Lincolnshire to be a colony, and there's this kind of very furious Daily Mail article about how ill-informed the British people are in 1940 about, about empire and how stupid they are and how they, you know, it's the fault of the education system. When you actually drill down into it, like, yes, of course, you get these odd answers, but actually quite a lot of people can name a colony because the headline figure is less than 50%. Name a colony. A lot of them can, but they've slightly used the wrong terminology. Or you know, they're being polled in 1948, and a lot of them are talking about India and Pakistan and things. And it's like, well, okay, these these are kind of understandable. You know, or they're naming um, at one point they name protectorate rather than a colony, and the, and the um, survey makes well, it's not a colony, so we're not counting that. So actually, people know a lot more about the empire than the survey looks like. It's just that they maybe don't you know the proper terminology for talking about it. But the other thing I would argue is the fact that the British people in 1948, because of the Second World War, at one point, you know, quote unquote, standing alone with only the empire with them, a moment of a massive mobilization of the war, um, of the empire, um, and an enormous kind of movement of imperial peoples to the metropole and from the metropole to the periphery. And in 1948, a lot of them still think Lincolnshire is the most kind of, you know, salient colony. I think that tells you something about Britain's relationship to empire, which isn't just, oh, it didn't affect people. I think, it's much, I think it's much more complex than that. I think there's a much more of an argument to be made, which I try to make in the book, which is that imperialism is something which is taken for granted in Britain at this point. It's something the British people sort of engage with on a, on a bones deep level without having any intellectual engagement in it. And that's sometimes why colonial atrocities can kind of go without comment in Britain because there's a, either a lack of understanding or a lack of um, desire to think about those things. So I think a lot of the time when when we when we come up with these moments and, and Ben you know Ben thought his book is obviously very good but when you when you kind of come up with these, these pieces of evidence that show people didn't care about imperialism that well maybe not caring is actually something we should think more critically right. about that is not caring doesn't mean it's not important. Um, I think this is where it's so important to consider the, the geography of the British Empire. Um, I mean, there, there were occasions when empire was an explicit political issue. There's a couple of you know, elections, there's a Chinese election, you basically said Opium War, there was a Midlothian election later, and Zulu War and Afghan occupations were, were important. But more often, one of the most imperial things about Britain was the distancing of its colonisation and it, its slavery. And no one would argue that, the, um, that slavery is not intrinsic to US history because it's there, it's in the fabric of, of the, the nation itself. Britain exported its, its slavery to, to the Caribbean and the Americas and other slave making colonies. And that, that distancing enabled the fantasy of a, a white nation, that separation between sort of simplistically citizens and colonised subjects, enabled Britons to imagine that all Britons were white. Fact, you know, the vast majority of British subjects around the world were, were black and brown. And with the loss of, of that, uh, the, the imperial power, the, the economic stimulus um, that came with empire, you had this sort of immediate switch back into, well, we will buy it all along. And you can see this with Enoch Powell, you know, as soon as he realizes that the empire is, is lost, that it's a failed project, it's as if it never mattered at all, because before empire, we were a white nation, we were self sufficient. Fabrication because, of course, Britain as a nation emerged concurrently and through coexistence with it. But nevertheless, we can now revert to the white Britain that we always were uh, and keep out these, these subjects who are never part of us anyway. So, that, that sort of um, disavowal is actually the most imperial thing about Britain, um, and it makes us more of an imperial nation rather than less of one. Okay. This, is a, this is a five minute warning to the audience. I'm going to, I'm going to, in, in about five minutes, I'm going to throw uh, things open to the floor. So get your questions ready. But just one, one final question to all, all of the panelists <coughs> get. Um, there is, a, there is another kind of 
sort of strain of criticism of the sort of work that you're writing, which again is sort of on the back of the Black Lives Matter movement, that thinking about British history in terms of empire enables you to cast everything in terms of race. Right? And that's something that we, we take from the States. It's something that, you know, a younger generation of readers will understand very well. But actually, up until the 1970s or 80s, all, always, if you like, the, the real dividing lines of Britain have been class. That, that certainly before the Butler Education Act, class was the great divide. And I was almost thinking about this when I was reading Charlotte's book and, and the, the, sort of the encouragement to people from working class backgrounds to go abroad, to find a new life in the empire. That in a sense, you know, that, that, that kind of transformation that people expect to get from education now could then only be got really from, from going abroad. So what, and, and I, I, I do think that for younger people now, it is almost unimaginable what a, what a strict divine class was, rather than race, certainly in the first half of the 20th century. Charlotte, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on in the book. So, yeah, there's this moment in, well, from the 1930s through to the 1930s, is actually there are sustained campaigns for migration from Britain to the Empire and a lot of people are very classed. So there's the kind of standard call for British people to come to Australia and New Zealand, which obviously becomes the £10 bond scheme in Australia. There is an, an increasing kind of um, pull of people to Rhodesia and Kenya, and obviously that's a very different class profile. So Kenya is, you know, are you going to get a job or are you going to go to Kenya? <coughs> Kenya. Um, you know, the sort of the, the class profile of, of particular colonies plays into this. Obviously, India has its own very stratified um, white British, uh, you know, if people from every class might migrate to India, but they will have a very class existence in India just as they would have in the um, Australian colonisation, actually, um, as I write about in the book, the charity Bernardo's is sort of works with the British government to send orphans, or in fact often not orphans, but simply children in care to Australia, and they do this explicitly as a government document which says, which essentially says, and I'm not paraphrasing that much, sort of says these children are a burden on the state already and they will continue to be a burden on the state for months or seven for abroad. They're a burden on the state for their foster homes and they will continue as they go into adulthood to be a burden, so we should send them to Australia. So the language of empire is the language of class, absolutely, but I would argue that you can only understand this through an intersectional approach. So I think you have to think about class and race, because as Alan has said, the, the kind of um, the British nation which is constructed through empire is one which takes whiteness as a kind of an unsaid reality, which is what then enables you to focus on class distinction and enables class to be the big dividing line, because whiteness is just there in the background all the time, underpinning all of this stuff. Um, you also have to think about gender, because actually, you know, of course, British society was very shaped by class, but it was very shaped by gender in this period as well. And again, that's that's really racialized, right? White womanhood and white manhood are really specific identities for the British. Yeah. And people of colour living in Britain, as they do throughout, the, in my, my book starts with the beginning of the Second World War, you know, that there are people of colour in Britain for the whole of this period, and their lives are shaped by class <coughs> and gender as well as by race. Um, but when we say that British people's lives were mostly shaped by class in this period, what we mean is white British people's lives, because people of colour's lives in the 1930s and 1940s were shaped more by race than by class. I would say. So I think, you know, perspective on that is, is kind of key. So yeah, you hear it quite a lot. People will say to me, you know, yeah, but British Empire, is ma it was mainly something that benefited posh white Englishmen. And I can see why they think that, but it's just not true, is it? I mean, the Scottish who like to see themselves as colonised were disproportionately involved in empire. I mean, Robbie Burns famously was about to become a slaver, wasn't he? Until he got some money. And the next day he was off to, he was meant to go off to the West Indies. Uh, you know, I've been reading about how the Royal Ulster Constabulary was used as a model yeah. for all colonial, most colonial police forces. 
and how the Irish went around the world. And also, you know, when it comes to the working classes, I've been I'm making a documentary at the moment about the history of tea. The way in which tea became the fuel of the working classes during the Industrial Revolution, you know, they were sustained by beer, which they made at home, and suddenly became too expensive to make your own beer, and they were given tea instead, and which they put loads of sugar into, and hence builders' tea. But that fueled and gave these working classes, you know, very lacking in nutrition <laughs> tea to keep them going during the day. So all sorts of aspects of non-posh, non um, non-English life was sustained by empire. Um, I, I think one of the most disturbing things about the backlash against Black Lives Matter is the denial of, of racism and the salience and the experience of, of racism both in the past, the colonial times, and today. And we see it taking various forms. There's a government emphasis since the, the <coughs> Commission on Racial and Ethnic Disparities report, which is a, a whitewashing of racism. Now, immediately, you had an educational report put out which suggested that white working class kids were being disadvantaged by Black Lives Matter, by critical race theory, by being told that they had white privilege and that this was somehow detracting from their education. Um, this use of the term white working class, well, what about black people? Can they not be working class too? Isn't there a sort of more integrated working class in many cities, for example? And one of the really disturbing aspects is actually the relegitimation of cultural racism. And this was such an open part of the debate that I have with Bigger when I reviewed his book, he argues that the only thing that counts as racism is biological determinism, scientific racism, mm -hmm. the idea that black and white people are fundamentally biologically different and that black people will never have the capacity to become civilised like white people. And so he argues that cultural imperialisation of Stuart Hall called it, which has always been twinned with biological ideas of racism, is not racism. And he even goes so far, went so far as to double down. Um, he uses a quote from a, a writer who suggested that Africans lacked compassion because they lived in such a sort of doggy dog environment that it wasn't in their kind of evolutionary interest to show compassion. He argues that that statement is not racist because the reason they lacked compassion was environmental, not biological. And that kind of insidious reintroduction of an idea of what is not racist and is patently racist, I find it extremely disturbing. Uh, and the fact that it is becoming re-legitimized. And we one only need to look at ONS data, Office of National Statistics data, to pick up Charlotte's point that intersectionality prevails, that people are disadvantaged by race in terms of housing, in terms of employment, income, the prison system, education, and so on, as well as by, by class. The, the disavowal of that I find extremely disturbing. Thank you very much.